I couldn't help but feel the excitement. My 479th fighter group was the lead, out in front of the two bomber groups and not tied to close escort or stuck at the back of the bomber stream hoping to sweep up the leftovers. Hub Zemka had gotten us where I knew we belonged, at the cutting edge. As a new flight commander, I was ready. I had two kills and wanted more. The weather was good, the sky was clear, we were at altitude and had gone into Zemka's fan formation, so we had a good chunk of the sky under our control. All we needed now was for Jerry to show up. There was no good reason why he wouldn't. Since D-Day, we had been taking the war to Hitler. It was payback time for the indiscriminate abuse he had rained on Britain. We were going deeper and deeper into Germany, and it felt good. With Zemke at the helm, the 479th was finally getting on the shortlist for the good missions from 8th Air Force. Strafing trains and supply convoys was fine. Bombing the occasional bridge or supply area was necessary. But it was air combat that we wanted. Bombers drop bombs. Fighter pilots fight. It was simply the way it was meant to be. We hadn't expected any reaction over the North Sea, and we didn't see much going in over Holland. As the force turned southeastward, I edged Blue Flight out just a bit farther to the left. The flanks were the place to see the enemy first. With the 479th across the front of the bomber groups, and the 434th spread to the left, my flight was the farthest left of the leaders. I'd briefed my guys that we would edge away a bit to give ourselves every chance of first engagement. I looked over my left shoulder for Hollister, my wingman. He was forward of where he usually flew, and that wasn't a bad thing. He could always fall back during a fight, but it was damned hard to get back forward once you lagged. It was cold at 28,000 feet, but I could feel my back damp with sweat against my flight jacket. I flexed my hands on the yoke and checked once again that my gun sight was up, my guns were armed, and my belts were tight. I pushed the vent for the puny cockpit heater down toward my knees. I didn't want a blast of warm air fogging the canopy at the wrong moment in a battle. I scanned the horizon, looking for contrails or telltale dots that simply didn't belong there. It was quiet. The only aircraft to be seen were the scattered forktails ahead of the spears of contrails from the bomber formations. I checked Hollister again and caught the back of his head as he peered intently to the north. His wing rolled up slightly with the effort of his straining in the cockpit. It was good. He was doing his job. Radio discipline was good so far. Three squadrons on one frequency were never easy to deal with. It only got worse when the enemy showed up. Critical calls were hard to distinguish. Call signs went out the window, knowing who was saying what was impossible. Fear, adrenaline, excitement, whatever. So far, so good. I checked Hollister again and caught the back of his head as he peered intently to the north. His wing rolled up slightly with the effort of his straining in the cockpit. It was good. He was doing his job. Radio discipline was good so far. Three squadrons on one frequency were never easy to deal with. It only got worse when the enemy showed up. Critical calls were hard to distinguish. Call signs went out the window, knowing who was saying what was impossible. Fear, adrenaline, excitement, whatever. So far, so good. The engineers don't ever poor. They've got a rhythm, a beat that signals the minor differences in props and RPM and mixture. When it's constant and steady, you feel relaxed. When it is loud or too fast or too slow, it jangles the nerves. If it changes suddenly, it stabs you instantly into action. It screams that something needs attention right now. The single-engine guys don't know about that pulse, but in the lightning, you live with it all of the time. There's a continual tweaking, fiddling with the throttle quadrant, watching the gauges, adjusting the props to get just the right resonance between the pair. It's sort of like a team of high-stepping gated horses staying on the right tempo. My left hand stays near the throttle quadrant, dancing a slow waltz between the power levers, while my ears tell me what is getting better or worse. My eyes stay on the horizon. There's always something that needs doing. The bomber guys have a committee to tell them what, when and where. They've got manuals and checklists, and a cast of supporting actors to read them aloud and double-check that it all gets tended to. The fighter pilot is driver, navigator, gunner, bombardier, and flight engineer, 
wrapped into one tense, high-strung package. If he's good, he covers it all. If he isn't, he misses some things. I've been pretty good so far. I haven't missed the major things, and the minor ones haven't killed me. If I'm doing it right, I'll keep getting better. If I'm not, I won't be able to worry about it. The radio crackles. Has someone seen something? There's no call to follow. Nothing. Just a crackle. I look back to my right and see that we've widened out spacing on Zemke's bison squadron. It doesn't bother me. I want to be out here on the edge of the package. I want to see the enemy first. Is that something? Are those aircraft out there coming from the east? I raise my goggles and check the canopy for smudges. One, two, four. There are more. A dozen things happen at once. I push the props and mixture forward. The engines surge. I pull the yoke and roll left, climbing over Hollister's position. The radio starts to speak, and the first word I hear is blue. I know it's one of my guys, and I know what he's going to say. These are my bogies on our side of the formation, and I don't want to share. I mash on the transmit button, and the squeal of the two transmissions covers the rest. Hollister is inside my turn and drops below me. The rest of the group are now alerted, and they want to know what's going on. We're closing fast, and I radio to Bison Lead that we've got a formation at our eleven o'clock, and we're checking them. It's more than a formation. It's a damned armada. I've got forty, maybe fifty, Mi 109s and Fokker Wolf 190s ahead of us. As we get closer, the number keeps growing. The whole damned Luftwaffe is in front of me. The guns, the sight, the engines, the radios, the flight. Where's my flight? There's Hollister. I knew he'd hang on. Where's the element? Where's the damned element? They've lost us. Fuel. I've still got the drop tanks. I check that Hollister is clear and jettison the tanks. There's a pair of trailing Messerschmitts ahead. They haven't seen us. I'll have the first one before he knows we are here. Is this as good as life gets? I have got more than fifty enemy aircraft in front of me, and my wingman and I are the only ones here. I sure feel sorry for those rascals. The sight reticle is full of grey-green aircraft. My finger wraps around the firing toggle. My right engine coughs, sputters and quits. A split second and forty heartbeats, then the second one follows suit. Both engines are dead. Silence. Oh, shit. My first memories are of sounds. The clang of a halyard on a flagpole. Liberty engines warming up on the flight line before dawn. My father singing with his Air Corps friends in the living room below. By the time I was five, I could name an airplane by the sound of its engine on takeoff or landing. My father sat with me on the front steps of our house at Langley Field, made me close my eyes and name them one by one. P1s, P5s, DH4s, old Keystone bombers, P6s through P36, all seared sounds of aviation into my heart. At night, I hid in my pyjamas at the top of the stairs, listening to laughter, Tales of flying, and songs with incomprehensible words and unforgettable melodies floating up from the living room. I sat for hours on Saturday mornings watching P-12s in a Luffberry over the field pull up into a loop, then dive back through the circle again. My father brought glasses of lemonade and we watched together. He and his pursuit pilot buddies were gods to me, men of steel in planes of wood and cloth. I had to be a fighter pilot. I was born in Honolulu at Luke Field Hospital on July 14, 1922, to Army Air Corps, Captain Robert Olds and Eloise Wichman Olds. My mother came from a line of Hawaii landowners, my father from Virginians traced back to the Revolution, including Regiment Captain Return Jonathan Meigs, George Washington's aide-de-camp. Dad had been a pursuit pilot during the war in France before his assignment to Hawaii. When we returned to Washington, he became aide to General Billy Mitchell, then moved to Langley, first as student, then as instructor and director of the Air Corps Tactical School. When I was four, my mother died. I remember asking my father if she was in heaven with all the airplanes. He said yes. My father married again briefly after Mom's death. Divorced, then gave us two baby brothers, Fred and Sterling, when he married Helen Sterling in 1933. 
I grew up surrounded by an extended family of loving adults in comfortable surroundings in Virginia. There was always my father. He was a tough disciplinarian, a tender caretaker, an unquestioned leader, and a laughter-filled friend. People gravitated to him. My days were shaped by his intense energy and eagerness. He taught me to be tough, yet a gentleman. Manners and courtesy were paramount. He took me for my first flight in an open cockpit plane when I was eight. The Pulp Fiction heroes of G8 and his battle aces were also the real men that moved through my daily life. My father's Air Corps buddies were famed pilots of the Great War, all gathered in our home. I got to meet Eddie Rickenbacker, but was too awed to say anything. The gatherings started with tales of flying and progressed to passionate discussions of current events and dreams for the future. They invariably ended in song, led by my father at the piano and Tui Spatz on guitar. The brotherhood of pilots impressed me as much as the thrill of flying itself. As I grew, I began to understand the dreams of these early pioneers. World War I made them determined to change things. If they could make air power prevail in future battles, the horror of trenches, endless stalemate, and thousands of casualties with no discernible gain could be prevented. Airplanes could carry the war to the enemy, attack his industrial base and his lines of communication, destroy his transportation system, and quickly erode his will to fight. All this could happen from the air, but with aircraft not yet built. Such was the dream uniting these pilots. When publicly expressed, their vision met scorn and resistance. The Air Corps leaders were looked upon as lightweight, flamboyant flyboys, whose limited capabilities were of no consequence in the grand scheme of land and sea warfare. Airmen could not occupy territory or rule the sea. What good were they beyond providing eyes for the real fighting forces? What good was bombing or shooting from aircraft? It was laughingly admitted that the Air Corps could probably penetrate enemy territory, but not much farther than good artillery and certainly not as accurately. Billy Mitchell was court-martialed for his outspoken belief in the future of air power and for his criticism of those who denied that potential. My father was one of the men by his side during that trial. The outcome outraged Mitchell's followers and only encouraged them to greater effort. Mitchell died in 1936, but it would be World War II that vindicated his theories beyond any doubt. In 1934, Roosevelt ordered the Army Air Corps to take over airmail, and Boeing began the development of a new bomber. After an epic struggle with battleship admirals, my father and his peers managed the development of the B-17 in 1935. The first prototypes, 13 in all, were put under his charge. At Langley, Lieutenant Colonel Robert Olds and his B-17s became standard fare in newspapers and newsreels around the world. He led flights on goodwill trips to South America and made the Flying Fortress a household name, also breaking the military cross-country speed record when Howard Hughes held the civilian mark. When Germany invaded Poland in 1939, the world was stunned. The shock reverberated through America. Our army and navy were seen to be living in the past. While Britain gallantly went it alone, America had time to build, yet we were still not ready when Japan struck Pearl Harbor. It took another two years before US air power could be said to have a meaningful impact on the campaigns waged in Europe and the Pacific. As World War loomed, my father was tasked by Hap Arnold to build an organisation to ferry new aircraft from factories to their operational units. The ferry system grew into the Air Transport Command, an invaluable player in the Berlin airlift after the war, and later the Military Airlift Command. In high school at 6'2 and 190 pounds, I was a natural for football. I made the varsity and was chosen captain, followed by election to class president for three years. Hampton High won the Virginia State Championship in 1937. Subsequently, full football scholarships were offered by Virginia Military Institute and famous coach Earl Red Blake at Dartmouth at the end of my junior year. But I believed the only legitimate way to fly airplanes and not have to work for a living was to get a regular commission through the United States Military Academy. I would earn my wings, join the Army Air Corps, and become a fighter pilot. Simple as that.
To pass the academy entrance exam, I enrolled at Millard Military Prep when I graduated from Hampton High in 39. Studies kept us busy, but the radio kept us informed of world events. When news of Hitler's invasion of Poland hit, I wanted to go after him myself. There had to be a way to get into battle right away, and not wait four more years. The next day I sneaked off campus in my prep uniform and went to the Canadian legation in Hampton, determined to join the Royal Air Force. I filled out an application and handed it over. The fellow in the office eyed me sharply and asked, Son, how old are you? Twenty, sir. He knew better. Well, you need your parents' permission. Have them sign your application. I went home to my startled father, who said, What are you doing here? You're supposed to be in school. Dad, please sign this paper. I want to join the RAF. Nothing doing. He sent me back to Millard. By March 1940, we found a congressman in Pennsylvania willing to appoint me to West Point. Only problem was I needed to live in his district to qualify. I headed to Uniontown and lived for ten weeks in a small shared room at the YMCA, worked for an army recruiter, and swept a grocery store at night. The decaying town and grim faces of local mine workers made me more determined than ever to get into the air. On June 1st, my father delivered the news. I had passed the entrance exam and was accepted. We raced up the stairs to my room, gathered my belongings, and caught the last train to D.C. I was the first Olds to go to West Point, and the family was suitably proud. Millard Prep had given me a head start on plebe year at the academy, but I was determined to increase my preparation, rising before dawn to do push-ups and run laps around the parade ground at Langley. One month later, I crammed with a bunch of other point-bound boys into one compartment on the DC train to Penn Station. I think I saw a couple of girls dabbing at their eyes among the families waving goodbye, but mostly I saw my dad standing stoically behind the group. We locked eyes, and he nodded to me. Boyish chatter on the way to New York quickly turned to discussions of France's recent surrender to Germany. Roosevelt was already warning the American public that our nation wouldn't tolerate Hitler's suppression of free Europe. Would we make it to the war in time? West Point would provide me with a commission, but would it adequately prepare me for what lay beyond? Carrying a rifle on the long grey line was not my ambition. The last hours before the point seemed etched in slow motion. We walked from Penn Station to the ferry terminal, rode across the Hudson River, boarded the train from Weehawken, arrived at the spare grey West Point stop, and fell silent when we saw the grim faces of our reception committee. I stepped down from the train and my boyhood ended. You, mister, stand up straight, get your raggedy ass in line. Uniformed, white-gloved upperclassmen screamed into our faces. You are worms not fit to crawl on this earth. You only think you will be officers. By tonight, half of you lily-livered maggots will run home to mommy. You're a disgrace. Yes, sir, we yelled back. I could hear confusion and panic in some of the non-military kids. What did you say? Yes, sir, we roared. And that was that. They herded us into groups at the station, then marched us up the hill through the grey stone portals of West Point. As we emerged into the quadrangle from the plane, my eyes stared straight ahead, chin jammed back tight and spine erect. No time for awestruck sightseeing, time only for the business of arrival. After uniforms were issued and heads shaved, we were marched back across the plane to a spot above the river called Trophy Point. There, I raised my right hand with my fellows and swore allegiance to the United States. I was a U.S. Military Academy cadet in the class of 1944, a plebe, a beast. And, by God, this beast was going to be a fighter pilot. Plebe year was an intense grind with the rigours of locked-down cadet life and academics. I met Ben Cassidy my first day in Beast Barracks. Our parents had been close friends in Honolulu, and he and I had been stuck in the same playpens as babies while the grown-ups played gin rummy. We were better prepared for hazing, obeying orders, running an obstacle course, and bouncing quarters off our beds than half our classmates. 
Ben was the good student, while I excelled at military training and football. I suffered through classes by doodling caricatures. My company A pals gave me way too much encouragement, and pranks were part of life. Several drawings disappeared only to re-emerge on the faculty board. I caught immediate hell from a sour-faced history professor. Oh well, catching hell seemed almost as much fun as getting away with it. West Point's varsity football team in the fall of 1940 had its most abysmal record in 50 years, a second consecutive losing season, 1-7-1. to Our freshman squad wasn't much better in the beginning. We started with three losses but improved rapidly, ending the year 3-4-1. to The low point for the cause came with Army's brutal loss to Navy in front of a sell-out crowd in Philadelphia's Municipal Stadium. It was the rivalry's 50th anniversary. Army-Navy games had always galvanised football fans, but the battles raging in Europe really focused America's adoration on its military teams. Radios across the nation tuned in to the big game, including FDRs in the Oval Office. My freshman teammates and I were in the stands for that game, and I was overwhelmed by the crowd's patriotic fervour. Army lost 14-0, but it didn't matter. We didn't feel like losers. Our freshman squad would make a big difference next fall. The Point's new superintendent, Major General Robert L. Eichelberger, knew that cadets and army fans alike were demoralised by the losing streak. It simply wouldn't do. He courted America's best damn college football coach and Dartmouth's Red Blake came on as head coach when the squad started spring practice. I worked like hell under Blake and made the starting lineup. By the 1st of May... I was first string offensive and defensive tackle. Morale soared throughout the corps at the start of fall semester 41. Coach Blake spurred the team to fame as the nation's newest darling, and West Point was an undefeated 4-0 by the time we met Notre Dame in Yankee Stadium on November 1. The game was played in a driving downpour before a capacity crowd of 76,000. It was a total mud bath. My right shoulder hurt like hell from a stupid late summer swimming accident, but I played both offence and defence for the full 60 minutes. By the end of the first half we were so muddy nobody could tell numbers or uniforms apart. I was in physical agony, felt like a goddamn pig in a wallow, but God, it was fun. We battled the Irish to a stunning scoreless tie. It felt like a win, and we went home heroes. Surging national pride carried us like gladiators into the Army-Navy game on November 29. Tickets were sold out for months, a crowd of over 100,000 crammed into Municipal Stadium. Parking lots and city streets were jammed by groups of fans listening to their radios. All of America was tuned in. FDR's intention to attend the game was thwarted by the escalating situation in the Pacific. He was sequestered with advisers in a hotel but listening to the radio. The emotional roar of the crowd hit us like a tidal wave when we ran onto the field. We weren't two separate teams meeting to battle. There was only one team, united with the crowd, united with our country. It was the most memorable football game of my life. Army lost to Navy 14-6, but it didn't seem to matter who won or lost. Fans rushed onto the field. Both teams were engulfed in a wild celebration. Spectators in the stands stood hugging and weeping. Both team alma maters were played. The national anthem was played again. Cadets and middies stood close together, all of us singing our hearts out. One week later, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. Roosevelt's address to Congress on December 8th was broadcast to the Corps in the mess hall. Pandemonium broke loose. We stomped, cheered, whistled and clapped until our hands were bruised. We were going to war. America's first troops would be on the ground in Britain in January. Pilots would follow by early July. Dear God, we thought, please wait for us. Big news awaited the Cadet Corps in the spring of 1942. Europe's descent into the maelstrom of war had galvanised the nation into action. Roosevelt's commitment to ramp up military preparedness produced a stunning announcement. The class of 1943 would accelerate to graduate in January, and the class of 44 would graduate in June 1943. By God, it was really happening. 
Better yet, everyone in the Corps was asked to choose regular Army or Army Air Corps as his service branch. To the great dismay of the old-time infantry and artillery guys who'd been running the point for years, almost half the class chose Army Air Corps. This was it. I was on my way. When classes ended in late May, we were routed to flight training bases scattered across America. Qualification was determined through the neutral process of overall class standing. Thankfully, my military grades rescued my average academics. I was off to fly. Nothing else mattered. The summer of 1942 was glorious. A group of us volunteered for the Spartan School of Aviation in Tulsa, Oklahoma, after Ben Cassaday suggested he had friends nearby, meaning girls. With sunburns from Virginia Beach and a few successful days around the swimming pool at the Army-Navy Club, Ben and I boarded the train to Tulsa with our group. Upon arrival, we were met by an enormous man, naturally called Tiny. He turned out to be jack-of-all-trades for the flight school and mentor to all aviation cadets, military and civilian. We noticed Tiny was trying to hide his laughter from us. It was our damned jungle gym helmets. Some sadistic wag at the academy had foisted them off on us as the prescribed cadet summer head covering. Where was my riding crop? We loved our khakis and hated those stupid hats. To our chagrin, we became the laughing stock of the upperclassmen at flight school. We quickly found alternative headgear. The first day we met our instructors. My primary instructor pilot was a solemn-faced guy named John Costura, who turned out to be far less menacing than he looked. He gave us flight schedules and instructions with a fair bit of humour, a good sign. Flying would be mixed with ground school courses on weather, aeronautics, flight regulations, engineering, some field training, emergency procedures, and blah blah blah. Costura was a thorough, patient instructor. His admonishments came in a steady, quiet voice, his guidance taking quick effect. I found myself liking the man almost as a father figure, and did my best to learn as quickly as possible all he taught. In our barracks bull sessions I learned other cadets had instructors who believed fear was the best teacher. They shouted angrily and banged their students' knees with the control stick for emphasis. My IP's teaching style, on the other hand, greatly influenced my future. Our initial dual flights went well, and one sunny day, after I had amassed five and a half hours of flying time, Costura got out, patted me on the shoulder and said, OK, olds, take her up and give me four good landings. I gulped. Take her up? Oh my God, by myself? I was shaking as I taxied to the takeoff end of the grass field. I was on my way to being a pilot. Despite the nervousness, I took off smoothly. Hot damn, I was solo. The landings were good and I knew it. Mr. Costura's smile when I taxied in was one of the richest rewards of that period. Days at Spartan passed swiftly. Most of us passed the challenges. A few washed out and returned to the academy or went on leave. In between having me march occasional punishment tours with a parachute on my back, Mr. Costura spent extra time teaching me aerobatics. We looped, rolled and spun daily out of sight of the airfield. Sometimes he'd point out an isolated shack and yell, It's full of Japs! Strafe it! I dove in, pretending my training plane was loaded with bombs and bullets. He laughed at what I thought were perfect attack passes. More solo flights were sheer joy. Being alone in the immense sky, master of plane and self, was beyond anything I had imagined. Practising what I had been taught and experimenting further into the envelope of possibilities worked a magic I can only describe as ecstasy. It was total exuberance, surrender and mastery all at once. The day finally came for a last check ride with an Air Corps officer assigned to Spartan. This was it. Flunk and you were out. Pass? and you graduated from primary and went on to basic training. Mr. Costura briefed his flight and told us not to worry. We would be okay. Just do what he had taught us. Remember the importance of picking out two good objects for turning points in the Pylon 8 manoeuvre. Make sure they are 90 degrees to the prevailing wind. That will make it easy to keep your wingtip pointed right at the pylon when you do your figure eights and make sure you pick out a good emergency landing spot when the instructor suddenly cuts your engine, he added. Pylon 8s? What were those? 
I had never done one. When Costura finished, I rushed up to him. Sir, we never did those pylon eight things, ever. Costura looked blank for a moment, then the light dawned. He'd spent time with me playing, doing acrobatics beyond the normal curriculum, attacking storage sheds and other useful things. He shouted, Hold it right there! Then went running down the hall. He returned quickly and told me to grab my parachute for a quick lesson on pylon eights. I was as twitchy as the proverbial cat on a hot stove, but I managed to pass the check ride and was declared ready for basic. Everyone was authorised a ten-day leave before reporting back to West Point for fall semester. My father had a special treat in store. He sent a plane to carry me back up to Spokane, Washington, where he was commanding the Second Army Air Force's bomb wing as a new major general. Reaction on the Tulsa flight line was priceless when a huge B-24 arrived. Of course I milked it for all it was worth, sauntering casually out to the plane and turning with a final thumbs up at the stunned crowd. The B-24 pilot turned out to be a West Point grad who would rise to be a four-star general, then president of Pan American Airways. After a lazy five days with my father and his delightful new bride, I was flown back to Washington, D.C., in another B-24. I was twenty years old and completely full of myself. I was a pilot and a first-class cadet. Life was innocent. Life was good. Those of our class in flight training knew we would take basic and advanced at nearby Stuart Field during the compressed coming year. But how were we to fit it all in? Life was a frantic routine. Days were divided between classes and flying, alternating mornings and afternoons, plus football practice every afternoon. Study time was at a premium, and there were many nights in the Johns after lights out just trying to keep up. Academics were intense, with two full years now compressed into one. All of us were graded each day in every subject, and the grades were posted. There was no such thing as a bell curve or getting off easy. The daily schedule was not for the faint of heart. Half of us were bussed the 17 miles to Stuart in the morning and did our flight training. We then went back to the point and academic classes that afternoon. Those of us on the squad practised football until chow. The next morning we had academics and then flew in the afternoon. This schedule rotated between the two halves of the class who were in flight training. By an arrangement through Coach Blake, I was always scheduled for the afternoon's first flying and was sent back to football practice in a truck. All was OK until we entered the night flying phase. With that, I was put back into a truck after football practice, went up to the field and met the schedule for my night flight. Mind you, sometime during all of this, I had to study for the next day of academics. There was no slack in the system. Flunk a course or two, and that was that. You were out. Gone. The pressure was enormous, but we faced it and grew used to the challenge. Very few, if any, of my classmates failed courses that year. In the middle of this craziness, game schedules continued as usual through the season. Buoyed by Cadet Corps morale and national fervour, we faced Navy again. This encounter became the hardest, physically, of my football career. At the start of the second quarter, a middy smashed a deliberately vicious forearm into my face. I crashed to the ground, put my hand to my mouth, and felt gushing blood and a terrible gap. Where the hell were my goddamn teeth? I crawled around the grass, searching for them. Red Blake and my teammates yelled for a doctor. They hauled me off the field and laid me out in the locker room. I struggled to get up and back to the game. The team doctor sat on me, closed my gums and torn lip with thirty stitches, and ordered me done for the day. I jumped up howling at Blake until he overruled the dock, with cotton stuffed up my nose, blood all over my uniform, and black stitches where my upper lip used to be, I emerged back onto the field to the roar of the crowd. Lined back up in front of that same middy, I smiled a toothless bloody grin and growled. At the snap I hit him hard and came down on him with one knee, then whispered, How's that feel? That guy got carted off with two broken ribs, out for the game. The game continued in a brutal back and forth, but Navy won 14-0. For some reason, my performance during our 6-3 season earned me All-American honours, but I never did get my goddamn teeth back.
At Stuart, we called our flight instructor in basic, military bill. He was the only one who lined his flight up each day for inspection. He'd pace back and forth imparting orders. In the air, his flight instruction had the same pompous bluster. Surely no one flew an airplane better or knew more about one. We were to understand that clearly. The only problem was, I quickly learned I could fly the BT-13 better than military Bill. Unfortunately, he learned it too. Sure enough, Mill Bill did what he could to cut me down to size. He announced that I was too big for fighters. He was going to see to it that I was sent to bombers. He did, and I was assigned to Twin Engine Advanced for the final phase of training the next semester. I was deeply disappointed to have my hopes for a fighter pilot career dashed by someone like Bill, but I would continue to do the best I could. Basic training ended just before the short Christmas break. I went to my roommate Scat Davis's home in upstate New York for a visit. Scat had washed out of flight training before it even began, due to bad eyesight. He was beside himself about it. It seemed grossly unfair because he was just colour blind. I promised him he would fly with me throughout my career. I vowed that his name would be painted on every aircraft I flew. Scat's parents made us comfortable for the holidays. It was the best Christmas vacation I'd have for the next several years. We went back to the January grind, with June just a blink away, entering what was traditionally known as the gloom period at the point. Football season was over, and I was aware that my glory days on the field were gone for good. I missed the exercise and team camaraderie. Life was getting serious. The dank winter weather deepened that mood. Grey granite walls dripped with black icy water and slushy snow piled up in every corner. The sun hid behind dark clouds and never showed its face for weeks. Academics were demanding and never-ending. Our instructors were in nasty moods, probably from dealing with our own gloom. Day after day, hour after hour, we stood in our raincoats as the tactical department tried to think of something to improve the mood of assemblies. Marching didn't do it. Even roommates fell to quarrelling with one another. I was lucky. My two roommates, Uncle Wilk and Scat, always had smiles on their faces and mischief up their sleeves. Our area in the barracks resounded with laughter as some poor soul found liquid shoe polish in his shoes, tried to clean his trashed room fifteen minutes before Saturday inspection, or found pages of a book glued together. In the midst of gloom period antics, Ben and I went to New York City on weekend liberty in March. Just before returning on the evening train, I had one scotch and soda. That's all. When we headed for check-in at the point, I was confronted by a guy who seemed to harbour a personal vendetta. He finally got me with the honour code by asking, Did you drink? I answered truthfully, Yes. I was number eight in class military standing but that was the end of my time as cadet brigade captain. My classmates went up in arms in my defence to no avail. From cadet regimental staff, I got busted down to private, only the second cadet in the history of West Point to earn that dubious honour. The punishment included marching tours right up to graduation. One more thing to add to my schedule. My multi-engine instructor for the bomber lead-in, Lieutenant Hacker, didn't like the thought of having to fly two engines any better than I did, but our AT-10 was a decent aircraft. I learned to enjoy everything about it. He was good at his job and honed my abilities with enthusiasm. Soon he admitted that I could land the bird better than he. Eventually the weather cleared and we took great glee in doing a few loops and barrel rolls, knowing we were breaking the rules for student bomber pilots to say nothing of restrictions against doing such manoeuvres in the good old AT-10. Another restriction prohibited us from penetrating any airspace near the FDR estate south of Poughkeepsie. That was too bad, I thought. Roosevelt might welcome the entertainment. One day, Lieutenant Hacker and I got crazy and flew under every bridge on the Hudson from Albany to New York City. That escapade implanted in me a love for pressing the limits of flight a fascination that would piss off many bosses for the next thirty years. Lieutenant Hacker and I promised each other we wouldn't discuss our adventure with anyone, ever. Rumours abounded when calls came in from witnesses, but I faithfully kept that secret until long afterward. I don't know how he managed it, 
but that lieutenant convinced the powers that be that I should be sent to fly fighters. Military bill got overruled. I probably owe Hacker my successes and possibly my life, considering the losses suffered by bomber people in the war. Graduation was approaching when the saddest event of my young life blindsided me. I knew my father had taken ill with pneumonia and had been lying in a Tucson hospital for several weeks. Nina, his new wife, was constantly by his side, telephoning me with daily reports. His recovery seemed certain. She sent hopeful assurances. On the morning of Friday, April 23, my brother Stephen and I were fetched out of class and informed that Dad had suffered a heart attack the night before. He was asking for us. We flew immediately to be with him. As my beloved father lay dying, I held his hand and told him I was going to be a fighter pilot. He smiled weakly at me and said, Listen to me. I never once went up in the air without learning something new. Never, ever think you know it all. He died at noon the following Tuesday. His ashes were taken up in a B-24 and scattered over the mountains west of Tucson. I was devastated. Life at the point seemed trivial for the next month. Only a steely new determination got me through. My father's mother, Grandma Topsy, came up as my date for the graduation festivities. General Hap Arnold pinned on my class pilot wings May 30. I grimly marched my tours off through the night, completing the last one just an hour before graduation. On June 1st, 1943, I received my diploma to thunderous applause from the cadet corps, but without the one person who mattered most. As I repeated the words of the officers Otel and stepped into manhood, I dedicated my wings and my commission to the memory of my father. Then I stepped off the fields of West Point and into the wild blue yonder. With second lieutenant bars and shiny new pilot wings, I joined seven West Point classmates with orders to Williams Field, Arizona, for training in the P-38 lighting. Our group included a mixed bag of personalities, all good young men, but as different from one another as any such number could be. Al Tucker, Lou Nesselbush, Charlie Waller, Hank Rosness, Buck Corsi, Don McClure and Bob Orr went through the fighter training with me, and each of them played a role in showing me how individual personalities meet the stresses of war. I don't claim to have been aware of their impacts at the time, because life was too challenging, too much fun, too exciting, and too immediate for any of that. The lessons I learned took effect slowly, and often weren't recognised until years later. Those of us who survived became wiser and more mature in many ways without realising it. We all became members of the 479th Fighter Group and went to war together. One was killed, two became POWs, one almost finished a tour but quietly disappeared, two finished and went home, and the remaining member went on to fly two tours and became a 22-year-old major and ultimately commander of the 434th Fighter Squadron. That was me. Our train ride to Chandler, Arizona, was long, hot and crowded. We had an appointment with the future, and it included a raging world war. We felt it was the place we were supposed to be. In Chandler, a truck picked us up for the 20-minute drive to Willie Airfield, where we signed in and received a long list of offices to visit. The duty NCO gave us billeting assignments and orders to report to our training unit for duty the next morning. The rest of the day was spent wandering over the sprawling base, finding the dozen important people who acted very bored as we signed paper after paper, and listened to briefings concerning how we were to behave for the rest of our lives. These briefings were structured to make us feel we were the lowliest creatures God ever created, outranking no one and subservient to all. We were disabused of our perceived valuable status as newly commissioned second lieutenants. However, after Beast Barracks at the point, this was nothing. As a matter of fact, it was exhilarating. The next morning provided more of the same takedown treatment. Later we learned that this was a special treatment in response to the somewhat rambunctious attitude displayed by our predecessors in the January 43 class when they arrived at training. Lesson learned. Don't reveal your status as a West Point grad if it can be avoided. Have something to be proud of before you declare your value.
The P-38 would wait a bit in our training. First we had to fly the AT-9, a twin engine of dubious performance. The intent was to introduce trainees to the rigours of twin engine flight before meeting the P-38, sort of a training wheels approach before being unleashed in the high performance machinery. Fortunately, that phase passed quickly and the great day soon arrived. It wasn't a P-38 we were to fly, but a bird named the P-322. There were some major differences between the two, although they looked alike. For one thing, the props on the 322 rotated in the same direction, as opposed to the counter-rotating engines on the P-38. That meant engine torque we wouldn't have to deal with in the Lightning. In addition, the oil and coolant flaps were manually controlled. You flew with one eye on the temperature gauges, constantly adjusting settings for every phase of flight by sliding levers back and forth to keep the values in the green. The P322 lacked the turbo superchargers of the 38, and its performance at altitude was pathetic. These particular aircraft had been built for the Brits, who wisely refused to accept them. The generally accepted belief was that the P-322 was a more dangerous airplane than the Lightning, at least for the pilot. Training was organised and we quickly got into the swing of things. Later one afternoon, when I returned to my room, I found a note pinned to my door. I would report immediately to the base adjutant. I wondered what I had done to merit such individual attention. The adjutant was a crusty old first lieutenant whom I saluted smartly. He must have been in his late thirties, but he looked like Methuselah to me. He fixed me with a hard stare, but I detected a hint of humour in it. He held my gaze for several seconds before saying, Lieutenant, there is a lady in that building across the street who would like very much to see you. Through the double doors, turn right, and she will be at the fourth desk on your right. Can you manage that? I saluted and left. What in hell was this all about? I heard the adjutant suppressing a chuckle as I left. I found the woman easily and introduced myself. She was not as forbidding as I had expected. She smiled and asked me, Lieutenant, are you independently wealthy? It was a strange question. I wondered what she was getting at. I assured her I was not at all wealthy. She began a stern lecture. Lieutenant, whether you want it or not, and even whether or not you deserve it, Uncle Sam wants to pay you for serving in his Army Air Corps. In fact, he will do so each and every month. All you have to do is go to the base finance office on the first of the month, sign your pay record, and collect whatever may be due for your sterling service. You seem unaware of this little fact. It was obvious she was having a bit of fun at my expense. I blushed. She then added, Not only do we give you your basic pay as a second lieutenant, you get flying pay on top of that, plus any travel pay due, and you will even get what we call per diem occasionally. It tends to add up and makes it possible for you to pay your officers' club dues, to buy things at the PX, to eat, and to cover all sorts of expenses that lieutenants seem to encounter every day. See that sergeant down the hall in his cage? He has lots of money and is anxious to share some of it with you and he or someone like him will do so every month you wear that uniform. Now go, and it was nice meeting you. Damn, no one told me about this at West Point. What else did I miss? The sergeant counted out more money than I'd ever had in my life, and smiled as he told me what trouble the finance office had encountered in trying to find the missing lieutenant. As I departed, obviously looking embarrassed, he said, Don't neglect us again, lieutenant we might not find you twice. This was the most direct and enlightening education of my short career, and I was grateful to the people on the base for teaching me the financial facts of military life. I was going to be paid to fly. Within a short time, the reality of this business hit our group of eight. Bob Orr was flying solo, crashed and died. We never knew how it happened. It stunned us, but it was reality in the life of a pilot. We had lost five classmates back at the point in training accidents before graduation, and wearing wings didn't keep it from happening now. I'd have to learn to deal with it. I was sorry to lose a good friend and squadron mate, but glad it wasn't me who had bought the farm. Despite accidents, our self-confidence soared, 
and we would often dogfight among ourselves. It wasn't exactly against regulations, but it couldn't be ignored when two of us jumped a stray P322, which turned out to be our squadron sows. That afternoon seven of us were leaned up before the desk of a very livid major. We received a royal chewing out and wondered if this was the end of our fledgling careers. Finally, the major said he knew the ambush had been carried out by one of us and asked who had done it. He was astounded when Al Tucker and I stepped forward and confessed. He didn't know quite what to say. I guess he had never heard of the Honor Code. We had learned that officers do not lie, cheat or steal or tolerate those who do. We simply did what we'd been conditioned to do. He sputtered a bit, and I think he admonished us not to do it again. I was never certain whether he meant don't dogfight or don't jump him. It didn't much matter. Our next step was gunnery training at Matagorda, Texas. We reported at the end of July for a month. The base was on a spit of land jutting into the Gulf of Mexico south of Victoria, Texas. It couldn't really qualify as a hellhole because any hole there would have been underwater. Hell with humidity. We were there for training in aerial gunnery, and nothing else mattered. Not the oven-like heat, the lizards, the sandstorms, the wretched base food, or even the stinking, undrinkable water we were supposed to use. Whoever owned the Coca-Cola franchise for the base must have made a fortune. We even used the soda for brushing our teeth and shaving after a few people got sick from the water. A lot of the June 43 class assigned to all types of fighters had converged for this phase. On top of great flying, we had a whopping good time together.